sure that. Um, well, no, let me actually let me show you some other demonstrations. This up here. Okay, there's this uh, parameter uh, 28 here, and I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it to um, one. Reset. Start. There's my little guy. Where did he go? Ah, there he is. And let me make it speed up because it's kind of boring. Stop him and pick a different parameter. <laughs> Let me pick, or maybe a little 0 0.5. Reset, start. Okay, he's going to zero. He's gone to zero. That was there. And now, oh, and that uh, I started a different one. Yes. Okay. So stop. And let me pick here two. Say. Um, Okay, and you see it's going to this point here, and, and it, the time is continuing, it didn't, but it's gone to a fixed point, but you see it didn't go to it monotonically. What do you call a point that you, uh, that you go to like this? What, what do you call that point from yesterday? You call that a? He's not going anywhere, so he's a fixed point, but what kind of fixed point is he? Stable spiral, just so exactly. It's a stable spiral, and that's uh, that's what that point is. This value here, and let's uh, do 2.5. See what happens there. Reset, start. Okay, stop. Three. You're seeing more of that spiral. See. And so that tells you something, again, we're going back to yesterday's class, it tells you something about the relationship between R dot and theta dot. You see that it, if, if um, R dot is very large, you're going to have hardly any time for it to, to do any kind of circling. There's an omega that tells you that, uh, the, the speed at which it, it uh, goes around. And if the R dot is small compared to the theta dot, then, it, then you'll get to see a bunch of different um, uh, 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 circulations before it gets to where you can't see them anymore. Let's do 3.5. Okay. So you see more and more of these. Uh, let's do 5. Okay. So you see now that the R dot is becoming smaller and smaller compared to the theta dot. We're seeing more and more of these. And um, again, stable spiral. Okay, so that's. Uh, <coughs> I hope this will survive. This is, this is old, old Java. You we'll see. Wow. Um, not very. Uh, so sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It's not. Obviously, I've been meaning to write all of these over again myself since forever, and haven't quite done it yet. Um, so let's go back to the class and see some explanations of all of this. Um, okay, so we okay, so we we stopped with convection there, and now we go to Lorentz model. Uh, you recall that what we just did was linear stability analysis of the basic uh, motionless conductive state. Motionless, you know, that was U equal zero. Conductive, meaning that heat is transferred by conduction. Uh, and um, not by convection. And now we're going to, uh, but recall I said before that that told us that you went back to conduction or the basic state or left, but it didn't say where you went to. So let's try and take the next step. Let us restore the J's. Now, um, uh, this was again, but now we would just do this uh, exactly and get everything. But uh, it's instructive to see what Lorenz did in 1963. Um, instead of going back to the whole nonlinear equations and solving them, let us start with the linear equations. And we had those functions, those functions that were 
um, <coughs> those functions psi that were sine k pi z and sine qx. And we know what is the Laplacian on a function like that. It's just uh, minus gamma squared times that function. So if you do this j on that particular psi that was an eigenfunction of the other problem with the boundary conditions and so on, if you do that to that psi, not to any old psi, but that psi, Laplacian is a multiple of the stream function. And uh, you can see that when you do cross derivatives that dx psi dz psi, effectively minus dx psi dz psi, of course you get zero. So this done on that psi, substituting those same psi's as before, which is not the proper procedure for solving nonlinear equations, but let's just go on and do this easy thing, you get zero. Let's do the same thing, so that wouldn't change that equation, if you use that psi. Let's again use that, the psi and the t that we had before. That is to say, we had for psi uh, the sine, and we had for t the cosine, and we're going to take the x derivative of the, um, of the psi and the z derivative of the t, and then the z x derivative of the t and the z derivative of the psi, and so that just turns, the x derivative turns sines into cosines uh, and takes out a q, and the z derivative uh, turns um, sine into cosine and takes out a pi, right? So I have a q and a pi being taken out, and some of the cosines have become sines, and some of the sines have become cosines. So I get this expression here from this, and I get uh, this, you can see you get Trig trigonometry, trigonometry, and you find that you can uh, combine them. Let's see. Yes, yeah, so you have, um, is this, sorry, I believe this is supposed to be an equal sign. Um, yes, I think this should be an equal sign. Can someone tell me that? Should this not be an equal sign or not? Yes, it should. This should be an equal sign. Okay, so you have cosine squared here and sine squared here times um, sine pi z, cosine pi z, sine pi z, cosine pi z, occurring in both terms. And sine pi z, cosine pi z, that's just sine 2 pi z over 2. <coughs> so that's what this term gives you. It gives you not zero, but something different of a quite different form. It's no longer trigonometric in x. It's, in fact, x independent. And so this is what you get, is a different functional form. So you see, okay, this might be telling you that, in fact, solutions to the linear equation turn out to be solutions to the nonlinear equation. But here you see, no. You take the solution to the linear equation, and you're getting some extra term. Okay, so let's put in uh, something of that form. Let's put in something of the form 2 pi z. Remember, this was in the temperature equation. This, this thing here occurred in the velocity equation, and this thing here occurred in the temperature equation. So in the temperature equation, you're creating something like sine 2 pi z. So let's put that into the expansion. So we do that. We have not just the t that was cosine qx sine pi z as we had before, but let's have a new term that looks like the one we just found, the sine 2 pi z. And now, of course, if we're going to put this t into the equation, we're going to have to figure out what is psi with that t here, so let's do that. We have the x derivative of the psi and the z derivative of the uh, t, this new t, minus the x derivative of the t times the z derivative of the psi. This, of course, doesn't contribute. You get, as before, you get the sine turns into a cosine. Here you have a sine that turns into a cosine. You pull out a 2 pi, you pull out a q, and this thing here, you can use trigonometry, and you have a, a 1 and 2, and that turns into a 1 and a 3. Right, everybody agree with that? Just trigonometry. Um, uh, with a one, factor of 1 half, which made this 2 disappear. Oh, I'm not taking my... my. Oh, sorry.
There, is that better? Yeah, okay. Um, so that's nice. This term looks like the original T term, good, but this is a new term. So of course, you know, you, you'd say, ah, I see, now I have to put in a term T3, which is of this form, cosine QX times sine 3 pi Z, and see what psi with T3 looks like, and so on. And that's called the closure problem, and that's why you can't solve nonlinear problems uh, just like that, and that's what people in the, uh, until computers, uh, what, well, it's still called the closure problem, and it's still what causes nonlinear problems to be difficult. I mean, if you didn't have any preconceived notion, you would say, well, of course it doesn't work. But uh, if you've been raised in this kind of approach, then you say, you call it a closure problem. Okay, so what Lorenz did, again, in 1963, was said, okay, let's ignore this term. Just forget it. Really, it's no more than that. Let's just forget this term. We have to stop somewhere. Let's just stop now. Okay, so there's going to be, the, the new functions are going to be uh, the original psi function, the old t function, and a new t function. And now we're going to plug in, and we're going to ignore the fact that we generate a sine 3 pi z here, because then we'd need a new functional form and so on. And here's what we get. <coughs> the things you remember this equation from before. It's the same one as before, because we saw that psi, Laplace and psi, didn't generate anything new. So this is the same one as before. This is like the same equation as before, not quite, because, um, okay, th these are terms proportional cosine qx sine pi z, but um, you recall that we did, taking the t2 term, we did generate something that was like the t1. So we have a source term here, psi t2 q pi, that comes from the t2. Okay, so that term gets add, that's like the t1 term, and so that here is a new term. And you see this is a nonlinear term. We have psi and t that occur as a product. This is a quadratic term that wasn't present before in the um, governing equations. Now we have the equation that governs the T2. We didn't do those calculations before, but some of the, most of them are quite easy. Um, we saw that, okay, one of them we did before. This one here, this told us we're generating a T2 sort of guy from the T1 sort of guy, right? This is what, why we, in the T2 equation, should be something like psi T1 Q pi over two. And let's check that term out. Right, that's the source for that. And then the last one was just supposed to be the Laplacian. And of course the Laplacian on something that looks like sine two pi Z is just two minus two pi squared. So this, these are the equations that result from the, um, the whole two-dimensional pre-slip Boussinesque equations if with the one further approximation of ignoring the generation of the sine 3 pi z. Okay, any questions? Procedure? And that is the Lorentz model. Not quite, there's a little bit more, we just, uh, we, you know, so the, I think you know the meaning of all these terms. This PR is the primal number, this RA is the Rayleigh number, you remember them from before, the Q is the wave number in the horizontal direction, the K is taken to be one because we know that's the only, that's the, the one that becomes unstable. Um, so you just uh, get rid of some of these constants by redefining terms X, uh, you call the new guys X, Y, and Z. X is basically the Psi, Y is basically the T1, and Z is the new guy, the T2. Then you end up rescaling time, again, to get rid of some of these, uh, some of these gammas. You, get, uh, you define a new Rayleigh number. Uh, notice, you recall that the, Rayleigh, the critical Rayleigh number for the free slip case was gamma sixth over Q squared. Everybody remember that? So that means that in these terms, the little r, its critical value is one. Okay, so it's just a simplification. 
Then this B, again, you, it's just arithmetic to get rid of the terms. Um, with the, okay, this becomes 8 thirds with the choice of Q, uh, the Q being um, this one here, pi squared over 2. Excuse me, just pi over squared over 2. Like Q equals pi squared Here, Q equals pi over squared over 2. That critical Q from before. Okay? And we're using the, uh, we're scaling the, by the Rayleigh number. So here we are, and then we just, uh, this is, sigma is sometimes used as notation for primal number. So here is the Lorentz model. This is the same as these equations, but just with these definitions with these constants. So people may well have seen these equations before, because it's very famous. Um, oh, and um, so all the, the B of 8 thirds, that's a numerical value from geometry, and the uh, sigma is usually set to 10. And why is that? Because that's the primal number for water. Um, and you can track all of the, um, the sources of these terms and understand them a little better. Um, base, this minus sigma x, this is damping. Uh, this goes in front of, um, uh, you know, it's this term that came from the Laplacian. Uh, Laplacian is the diffusivity. So this is a damping term. And this is the damping of the temperature, the, the diffusivity of temperature that, what, that, that had the, uh, the, that originally came from capital lambda squared. And um, you also n eventually can notice a property that there's, um, if you change the signs of x and y and not of z, then that yields no change in the equations. You see that if you change x and y here, you get minus here, but this is just minus x dot also. And if you change the signs of x and y here, you get a minus here, you get a minus here, a minus here, a minus here. So that equation is unchanged. And if you change, again, the signs of x and y, you have minus x and times minus y, which means no change in this, and you don't change the z. So you see that this these set of equations has this symmetry in um, x, y goes to minus x, y. And that corresponds, I think, doesn't it, to um, the fact that you have a role like this or this as convection solution, and it's the same. I think that's what that corresponds to. Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, so now, how many oh, people? Can I, sorry. Yes. The please. Z. Yes. The Z on that slide. So is that corresponds to the sine 2 pi Z? It does. It's so a that's coefficient like, to 2 pi Z. So does that mean that's like temperature going up in certain points? Th and that's right. That it, it means that you now have. Um, uh, you have a maximum and, and a minimum in temperature. That's right. Within. Okay, so z goes from zero to one. So you'd have. Uh, yeah, z goes from zero to one. So oh, is this true? Maybe just one max. Maybe one. Uh, yeah, no, no. But you're right to ask this. Mm -hmm. It's very long since I thought about this. Two pi z go between uh, x, uh, z equals zero and one. Uh, goes to one uh, it's one cycle, so it is. Right. It's uh, it's it's hotter and colder there. That's right. That's right. It is. Okay. Um, so um, okay. How, who? No, I shouldn't ask. Uh, sure. Okay, I will ask, but I'm going to close my eyes. Uh, who did the homework? <laughs> <laughs> and who didn't do the homework? <laughs> and who did and who didn't? Is it adding up to 100% anywhere? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I bet it's not. Right. It never does until you ask several times. Who did? Who didn't? <laughs> okay. So um, anyway, those who didn't do it have lost a chance to uh, do this exercise without knowing the answer. And that's too bad for you because now I'm going to give the answer. Okay. So supposing we want to find the bifurcations of these equations. Um, uh, we want to do a simple dynamical systems analysis of these equations. The first step of that is finding the fixed points. So we set these time derivatives to zero. That's the finding of x bar. I had written that before, the fixed points. So here we set them to zero. And in this case, this turns out to be very easy. Um, setting this to zero means that x is equal to y. Fine. And now, if x is equal to y, x factors out of this equation, 
and you just have minus z plus r minus 1 equals 0, so that gives you a formula for z, or the other possibility is that since x factors out of this equation, x is 0. Okay? So you have two possibilities for this, um, so this uh, equation. And as for the third equation, if you put in x equals the x equals 0 solution, well then you get, you get that z is equal to 0 as well. And if you put in the other solution, the z equals r uh, minus 1, then uh, you put in the z here. This is, still, this is x squared. So you get that x is um, the square root of bz, and z is r minus 1. So it's the square root of b r minus 1. So these are the steady states, the fixed points of the Lorentz model. The zero solution is, of course, uh, corresponds to the um, conductive solution, the base state where you have no motion and you have the linear temperature profile. So here are the three steady states of the Lorentz model, zero. And then uh, recall that we said if you change the sign of x and y simultaneously, you, still, you get the same, you get the equations again. So necessarily, if you have this solution with the positive square root, then you also have this solution with the negative square root. Um, so this, these new solu these uh, solutions here, they only exist, we assume that uh, these are amplitudes for physical quantities, they better be real. So these new solutions only exist if, if r is greater than 1. Yes, that's right. r better be greater than 1 for these solutions to exist. That tells you you have creation of two new solutions at r equals to equals 1. You go from, at r equal 1, you go from having only one solution to having three solutions. And what does that remind you of when you go from 1 to 3? Remember, we only learned three different bifurcations yesterday. We called saddle node, pitchfork, and transcritical. And so this one is a pitchfork, exactly, producing two new equivalent solutions, plus and minus. What's more, the uh, bifurcation is accompanied by a change in stability of the single solution that existed before the bifurcation. And um, so we can show all this. Let us write the, um, we can do everything with the formal tools that we did yesterday. We can write the Jacobian matrix. It's always a good idea to, to manipulate them explicitly because although you write them in these math terms, you write df and blah, until you've actually computed one, it doesn't really seem real. So we take all the partial derivatives of all of these things. What's the part, what's the, one one term. Well, it's minus sigma. That's the derivative of this with respect to x. What's the one two term? It's sigma. So let's check that out. Yes, minus sigma and sigma. And is there any dependence on the z? No. So if that first row should be minus sigma, then sigma, then zero. So that is the case. Then the second row, the derivative of this with respect to x should be r minus z. And lo and behold, it is. The derivative of this with respect to y should be minus 1, and the derivative of z with respect to z should be minus x. So we should get minus 1 minus x. Yes, we do. And the derivative of, whoops, I keep in the wrong direction, of this with respect to x is y. The der derivative of this with respect to y is x, and then minus b. So, so we should get y and x and minus b, and that's what we get. Okay, so this shows us the Jacobian. We recall that we have written many times um, the Jacobian, like that, and then we have written with an argument. It depends on where you are evaluating. Just as f prime, uh, you know, when you have just a scalar function, f prime is a function and you evaluate it somewhere. So we can evaluate this Jacobian at the fixed point, 0, 0, 0, which is one of the steady states. And if we do that, we get minus sigma, sigma, and r minus 1, 0, and 0, 0 minus b. You recall one of the things we said earlier today, which is to say that the eigenvalues of a block diagonal matrix are the eigenvalues of each of the diagonal blocks. So already we see a block diagonal matrix here. We see that one of the eigenvalues is minus b. The other eigenvalue, and here it is, minus b, it's always negative. So it can never contribute to any instability since it's negative. Recall we're looking for the eigenvalues in the Jacobian that's going to tell us the stability of the 0, 0, 0 state. <coughs> to find the eigenvalues, or we can just calculate the eigenvalues of, um, of this 2 by 2 block. 
Alternatively, we can look at, uh, remember we had this map of, of concerning the, uh, this picture of the, uh, with the trace and the determinant. The trace of this is minus sigma minus one. So the trace is always negative, and the product, uh, we, uh, excuse me, the determinant is um, sigma minus uh, sigma r. So the product of the eigenvalues is um, negative or positive, depending on whether you, um, whether you have r greater than one or less than one. Uh, so anyway, you figure all this out. For r less than one, you have all of these eigenvalues are negative, and hence zero is stable. For r greater than one, you have two of them being negative and one of them being positive. Uh, and when you have all um, all the eigenvalues are the same sign, you call that a node. When you have some being positive and some being negative, you call that a saddle. Hence, this point that was made yesterday, why do we call a saddle node bifurcation as it is? It's because it's the collision of a partial, generally, of a partially stable and partially unstable point with a completely uh, stable point, the saddle and node. And when one eigenvalue becomes positive, we have uh, we'll call that if any eigenvalue com becomes positive, then you have instability. So at that point, r equal 1, we have instability, and we have simultaneous creation of two new states. It's a pitchfork bifurcation, and it creates two new states, which uh, the two new states are like this and like this. And you recall that we said, when we did the normal form for the pitchfork bifurcation, I said we had an odd function. You recall, we wrote x dot equals mu x minus x cubed. And we said, why should you have a constant term and a quadratic term missing? Why should it look like that? I said, because if you had symmetry, certain kind of symmetry, then uh, you had to have an odd function. And the smallest degree, um, the, uh, okay, the smallest degree nonlinear function was this one. The smallest degree odd nonlinear function is this one. Right? If it was just mu x, that would be trivial. And the first nonlinearity you can put in is x cubed. So this is the lowest degree one. And I said this was a consequence of symmetry, meaning x and minus x were the same thing physically. And that's what we just found, except not with x and minus x. We found that with this, um, uh, this one here, x, y, go to minus x minus y. <coughs> and what's the symmetry here? The symmetry is that this is the same as this. Um, yeah, that's right. So you can see that, that that's really the same because these are periodic boundary conditions. It doesn't matter whether at the edge you have um, downwards or upwards. It's just a phase shift. So of course these two solutions are the same. 